All right, well, we are going to be in Matthew chapters 6 and 7. Today, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there um, with me. And I wanted to say to you guys, for those of you who are newer to this community, this giving wall is so awesome. We just put up our Christmas trees this weekend, um, and literally as we're hanging up ornaments, I was looking back from all the years of things we've been able to partner with and invest in. And it's just as like, it was when Becky was saying that, it was like, yes, that's like such a powerful thing to be like, five years ago, we as a family, whatever, we bought a sewing machine for a widow. Like, and this reminds me of that, you know, this ornament on my tree, like what, that's incredible, you know, or whatever it is. And so it's such a special thing. And we were actually, um, some people were joking earlier that, um, the, the ornaments have improved because um, Hona used to make a lot of the ornaments. <laughs> and they were like kind of just a big clump of like glitter and glue and God knows what. And awesome people would still buy them for the children. But now we have like Pinteresty people who make things. And so they're like super cute, legit ornaments. Um, I know you guys would still buy them because, you know, it's not really about the ornament act itself. But, um, but it's nice to actually have something prettier to hang on your tree than most of the ornaments I have purchased throughout the years that are on my tree. Um, there used to be, like, pictures of Hona's face, like, in a Santa Claus. Like, I mean, just, like, random. Actually, people love those ones. Hona's like, bring them back. So anyways, um, we might have some surprises up there. But for now, you've got some really pretty ones to choose from. Um, and I want to say this, too. They make amazing gifts. Amazing gifts. I don't know about you, but do you have people in your life, you're like, so what am I going to get them? They have everything. You know, like, they're, they buy whatever they want. Like, they, I don't know what to get them. Something really meaningful and being like, hey, you, like, my Christmas gift to you is you just fed 12 orphans for a month. What? Like, you know, like, that's amazing. Or you just, you know, sent a woman come out, coming out of sex, sex trafficking on, like, a healing, you know, counseling weekend. What? Like, that's, a, that's an incredible gift to give somebody. So keep that in mind. All right, Matthew 6 and 7. We're going to jump in here. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Many of you guys are familiar probably with this passage. This is Jesus' famous teaching. Jesus is um, teaching about his kingdom, and he's talking about, um, just what the nature of his kingdom is like, right? And so he's, he's talking about the culture of the kingdom. He's talking about, um, he's just this new king, like basically rolling into town and kind of outlining, here's how we do it now. Here's what my kingdom looks like. And so this is what this, this um, teaching comes out of. And uh, we're going to be in Matthew 6 and 7. So we're going to start in Matthew 6, 24. It says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's a good little place to pause. I can't be done. And I think we have to kind of get in our head the right mentality of that verse, because sometimes we're like, I don't serve money. I don't have like a little, you know, altar in my house with like the dollar sign that I like bow down and worship. Like, I don't do that, you know. But that's not what this is talking about. It's, it's do we serve money or do we serve God? What makes your decisions for you? Is it what God said or is it because that's what financially makes sense for me? Do I get up and go to work because I need to provide for myself or do I follow what God is, where God's leading in my life and trust that he's going to provide for me? Not that you have to be, not that we encourage you to not be irresponsible, like get up and go to work, you know, but what I'm saying is it's, it's different when you feel, so many people feel like I can't do that or I can do that or whatever based off of their finances versus what God is saying to you, right? Who, who we're not slaves to our finances. We're servants of the most high God, first and foremost. Money is just a, a byproduct. Money's going to come, money's going to go. Right? And so understanding that our allegiance is to God. Our allegiance is to him. We follow him. Um, and we're not bound to, limited by, or driven by finances. Because how many of you know there will be times in your life where God's going to tell you, do this. And you're like, wow, that doesn't make a lot of money. And God somehow didn't consult you on how your finances were going to be affected by that decision. Anybody ever had an experience like that? Yeah. We can't live in the realm of you can't actually serve both. It's going to be one or the other. 
And you're going to have to make that decision because I've tried. I've tried to have both of those competing things, and it doesn't work. Somebody's got to be the boss. So that's where it starts. You can't serve both God and money. And then it goes on into verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. We could pretty much just stop and go home right here, right? (laughs) Wow, let's just chew on that for six months and come back, okay? Do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. They're not hoarders. Oh, wait. I thought that's what it said. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? No, we're taking hours off of our life by worrying, actually, right? Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And then he adds this little right there, you of little faith. So Jesus is making this correlation with being worried about clothes and where you're going to live and how you're going to pay rent in L.A., very real things, very real human things, right? Real things. He's making a correlation, which is offensive to me at times. Because it feels very normal to worry about those things. And he says, worrying about those things puts you in the OE of little faith category. Ah! Sure, rent was cheaper in Bethlehem or wherever you were, Jesus. (laughs) Right? But the same truth applies. And then he goes on and he says... Verse 31, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. I mean, now he's just getting rude, right? Like, (laughs) wow. So now it's just not a lack of faith. It's actually the pagans. Like, the unbelievers, the people who have no clue of who God is, they run after those things. But then listen, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows that you need them. He knows what you need. He's a good father. It doesn't say, and God, and he could use a lot of words. He used the word father. Your father knows that you need them. And then it goes on, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. Right? This is powerful. So we're told, don't be obsessed with worrying, anxiety. Ah, How am I going to do this? How am I going to be? How am I going to? Freaking out after these things. Instead, we're commanded, seek first the kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. And everything else will be added to you. Now, you'll notice it says seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom. That's not my kingdom. Most of us, you know, well, no, that's not. Let me rephrase that sentence. It's not most of us. Sometimes people, that's better. (laughs) Been having this conversation with my kids. I'm like, no, it's, it's not always. Your brother doesn't always. We don't, you know, it's like, watch your language. Um. Sometimes people, we th- we're building actually our own kingdom, and we think it's God's kingdom. We're seeking first our own benefit, our own calling, our own kingdom, our own whatever. And we, you know, but I had three prophetic words, I put this bow on it, so, woo, it's kingdom. It doesn't really work like that, <laughs> Right? You seek first his kingdom. That means it's his order, his government, his agenda, his dream. It's important to him, right? You seek first his kingdom. And then it goes on, seek his kingdom and seek his 
righteousness. His righteousness. And you'll notice his righteousness doesn't take into account your culture, your own political perspective, your opinion. It's not your righteousness. It's his righteousness. It's not what you think is right. It's what he thinks is right. So it's not seeking our own kingdom or seeking our own righteousness. It's seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. And God has a lot to say about how we are to treat people and how we are to care for the marginalized and how we're to, you know, whatever. there's a lot that God has to say about how we're to have relationships because righteousness is about being right here, therefore setting every relationship right here. So when we're in pursuit, first and foremost, of his kingdom and his righteousness, then all of a sudden, everything you need gets added to you. You see, when we are in pursuit of everything we need, which is how a lot of people live their life, they're first in pursuit of everything they need. And then if there's leftovers, we'll talk about the kingdom. And Jesus flips that whole thing on its head and he says, actually, that's... That's not how it works. Seek me, seek my kingdom, seek my righteousness, and you watch, every, I bring everything to you that you could ever need. And let me tell you this, let me tell you this, I have seen this in my life. If you will do it his way, he will bring to you above and beyond what you could have ever brought to yourself by seeking your own benefit first. I'm telling you, I know that fear of if I let go and don't drive this thing, don't drive my own provision. Don't drive my own open doors. Don't drive. If I let go and don't do this, the fear is that I'm not going to have enough or it's not going to be whatever. And I'm telling you, God is faithful and God is good. And he will bring you far more than you could have ever, 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 ever brought to yourself. It's just the principles of the kingdom. He's so good that way. I love it, this verse in the, the end of that, in the Passion Translation, it says, so above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him, then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Isn't that good? I want to tell you this story um, that kind of shows how this works, but um, when Hone and I were first married, we were real poor. I mean, real poor. We were like full-time missions work. I was living um, in Kenya, and we just, we literally, we were in a season of giving everything away, not trying to acquire anything. So we were just giving it all away. We were both in full-time ministries and missionary. We were just, we were just like, okay, we're just going to go live on the mission field for a while, and, and um, just passionately going after God, and and so we had a plan because we were super poor, and we were like, okay, we're going to definitely wait a couple years before we have kids. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever ready to have kids, by the way. Um, for those of you who were, like, super ready, like, congratulations, you're one of a million. But um, so anyways, we were like, yeah, definitely going to wait a while. And whoops, we ended up pregnant. And um, like three months after we got married, and we're like, dang it, we weren't planning that. But okay, here we go. So... Um, so then we were about to have a baby and still poor, you know, how that works. And, um, and so part of the challenge for me was, you know, first pregnancy, you're having a baby, and, all, and we found out we were having a girl. All I wanted to do, now, guys, maybe you can't relate to this, but ladies, I mean, you walk through the baby section in Target, and you're like, oh, my God, it's so cute. I want to put that in my cart. You know, I want to buy this stuff. And it was just, like, cuteness everywhere, and I wanted to buy stuff, and we had zero money. And um, we were actually heading back into Africa and taking a team, and we just had no money to do it. So I was like, oh, like, this is so hard. Like, I, you know, I can't, I don't, is my kid going to have anything? Like, is this going to be, like, a little naked baby? Like, am I going to be that mom? Like, Amazon mom. Like, gen not like Amazon Prime. Like, Amazonian <laughs> mother. Like, what is happening? And um, it was just like, oh, this is hard. And... Anyways, we were actually at that time doing a clothing drive um, for kids because we were taking, like I said, a team into, into Kenya and Rwanda. And um, so we were going to take in some clothes to the kids we were working with. And so we had different people from Expression. We were, were giving, dropping off clothes. And we packed up all the clothes. And we packed the suitcases. And there were was, there was seven suitcases. And we packed them all up. And um, 
So we were like, this is awesome. And I was looking at the clothes. These were, these were, we had asked for gently used clothes, you know, and um, some of them were a little more than gentle. And we're like, toss those. But okay, so we, we gather these clothes and we pack these suitcases and we start um, traveling. And the first place we went was into Rwanda. And we took about half the bags and we left half in Kenya and took half the bags. And we thought, okay, with these bags, we're hoping that we can like, fully bless 50 kids. So we had four suitcases, and we were thinking, 50 kids, like, I think we can do it. Like, by faith, we can do this. And so we didn't just want to give every kid an outfit. We wanted to give every kid, like, a bag with multiple outfits, you know, pair of shoes, like, some school supplies, toothbrushes. Like, we had a whole little thing going. So we're like, okay, this is going to take a lot of faith. We're praying over our bags that God would multiply it, you know, because we're like, we need this to stretch for 50 kids. And so we get it all set up, and we have them. The kids come, and, um, you know, we have about 50 kids go through, and they get all this stuff. We're like, this is amazing. And there was tons of stuff left over. And so we're like, wow. So we had the pastors go back and get 50 more kids. And we're like, I can't believe 100 kids are going to get bags of stuff out of four suitcases. So sure enough, 50 more kids come through. They all get a ton of stuff. And we're like, this is crazy. So we're like, this is like kind of real crazy. Oh, well, whatever. Okay, so whatever. We, we're like, this is kind of wild. So we end up. Um, going back to Kenya after this, and we still have stuff left over. We still have stuff that we had from Rwanda, and we still have three suitcases in Kenya. So we're like, awesome. So we, um, you know, we begin to just invite, we're in the slums, and we begin to invite all the kind of, all the pastors of the area to bring their most needy situations um, to this home. And so all these kids are coming. And for our team, this was like dress up awesomeness. I mean, these little kids, you can't even recognize them, caked in dirt, you know, wearing rags, and we're like bathing them and coming, letting them come in and pick whatever outfits they want. I kid you not, we had parents who could not recognize their children. I mean, they're come out in the full decked matching outfit, you know, like the hat, the socks, the sh- I mean, they were just like, parents had never even seen their children in a pair of shoes. Like, what, they were so cute, and our team's like, oh my gosh, these kids are awesome. And so these kids are just getting all this stuff, you know, getting rocked and but part of what was crazy was I had packed those suitcases. I knew what was in them. And we're pulling out things. I'm like, I'm sorry, where'd that come from? <laughs> and where'd that come from? And it was like all this brand new designer, like insa- like Gucci baby guest. I'm like, I'm sorry, what is happening? I'm pulling all of this like top of the line, crazy, insane, beautiful baby clothes with tags on it out. And I'm like, I did not see that. What in the world? I'm just watching all these kids get radically blessed. And there was a moment, there was a moment in that where I sat there and I was like, God, this is so extravagant. This is so amazing. (laughs) I literally had this moment like, had I known that was in there, I might have saved that for me, you know? Um, I'm thinking like, wow, like, you know, are you going to be this generous with my kids? Because <laughs> we have no clothes either, you know, and I'm just like watching these beautiful things, you know, like go out to these kids. And, and there were, I just heard so clearly, I heard the Lord speak, and he just settled the issue in my heart. And he, so clearly he spoke to me that day. We were sitting there, and he said, I want you to get this. He said, if you will be faithful to look after my babies, I'll be faithful to look after yours. And I knew in that moment it was a done deal. I knew in that moment God was good. I knew he was going to look after us. I knew just like these little, these cute little babies in the slums are getting top of the line designer, like $300 jeans because God wants them to have it. God was going to take care of my kids. I just knew it was a done deal in that moment. I was like, God, you're so good. And it was incredible, and that day was just wild because, I mean, literally, it was like, okay, at that point, we realized something miraculous is happening because this is, like, not normal. And, um, you know, we just kept bringing more kids, more kids, more kids, and we just had all this stuff. And we're like, we're not running out. This is bizarre. And so I remember this, you know, there's actually a few, Hone was reminding me, there's a few cases like this, but this one particularly I remember so clearly um, where we had given out all the shoes at this point. So now we just had clothes, like a bunch of clothes and no shoes left, and um, there was one little girl who came late, and all the other kids had gotten shoes, and she didn't have shoes. And she, all she wanted, and she kept telling our translator, all she wanted was a little pair of black, like Mary Jane style little shoes she could wear to school. And she wanted them so bad. And, you know, they kind of, we were drawing their feet out and measuring their feet and doing the whole thing. And this girl's like size, I don't know, let's just say 12. I don't remember what size it was, but size 12. And, 
And, um, and so I tell the team, I'm like, do we have any more, you know, shoes? They're like, we have no shoes. We have searched, there's no shoes. Granted, we only have three suitcases. So it's not like there's like 30 suitcases to search through, you know? And they're like, there's no shoes. And I was like, yes, there is. In the name of Jesus, you need to stick your hand back in that bag and pull me out some size 12 Mary Jane shoes right now. And they were like, <laughs> right? And I'm like, do it. And they're like, okay, okay Jesus, who? They start praying in tongues, you know, and just, whoo, stick their hand in that suitcase. You guys, we were all like, oh, my God. Like, they pull out size 12 black little Mary Jane shoes for this little girl. And the look on her face was like, Jesus loves me. And it was just so awesome. And we see this little girl get shoes, and we're all, like, just wrecked, you know. Like, this is, God, you're so crazy. And... It was so awesome. And so we, you know, at this point, we're tired. We've done a lot of this. We're like, okay, we're done for the day. But we still have a ton of clothes left. And we're like, this is genuinely multiplying at this point. And honestly, kind of crazy. Like, we didn't really plan to keep having to give clothes out. So now what are we going to do, right? <laughs> we were traveling to the other side of the country. And we were like, we did not plan on taking these suitcases. But here we go. So we took these suitcases. And we're like rounding up the end of our trip. And we were like, okay, we actually have to get rid of this stuff. We're not taking this stuff home. So um, we got, like, we just were like, okay, let's do it. So we got these huge black trash bags, okay? Not like your little bathroom trash bag. I mean, big, hefty black trash bags. And we filled them up with clothes. We had seven suitcases to start, just mind you. Filled them up with clothes, and we took a huge trash bag of clothes to every single hospital and orphanage in the entire county district. Multiple, lots. And we would feel like, so we would put all the newborn baby clothes, like, in the, in the one big bag, and we'd take it to the hospital and be like, anybody who comes in here has a baby, has some needs, pull out of the bag, right? Here's, we'd find out, okay, this orphanage has mainly older kids. We'd put all the teen clothes in there, whatever, and send them. We just did this, right? So the group I went in um, was this big orphanage that had a couple hundred kids, and, and so we took this huge trash bag, and I knew their kids were kind of between four and 12, so I... You know, I'd personally helped pack that bag. We packed all this clothes for, for kids that age and showed up and greeting them, having some tea and, and um, talking with them. And, and the, the, the director of the orphanage says, by any chance, did you happen to bring any baby clothes? And I was like, oh, no. Like, you guys don't have babies here. And she, she was like, I know. But we just had um, a newborn baby um, was left in a trash can. And somebody found it and brought it to us. And so we're going to take this baby. We were taking this baby. She's only three days old. And I was like, shoot, we sent all the baby clothes to the hospital, you know. And, and at this point, I'm like, God's so dang crazy. I don't even know. There might be baby clothes in there. I, I literally was like, <laughs> let's look. I, I don't know. I am kid you not. We dumped this bag out. You guys, I keep, God is too much sometimes. I mean, too much. He just needs to stop. What is happening? Literally, literally, 23 newborn baby girl, frilly Easter African awesome dresses for this baby. 23. 23. We were just like, God, you are crazy. What? Um, yeah, we have 23 dresses for her because God's extravagant, and he thinks she needs to be frilly and awesome every day of the month. You know, like... <laughs> This is awesome. <clears throat> so we're just like blown away and just like, this is crazy, right? Well, we still have stuff left over. We still had stuff left over. And I, we were just like, this is, at this point, we're like, this is so supernatural and crazy. This is like real wild. Like we need to get rid of this stuff. So we do something that we would never, ever, ever normally do um, in a context like this for reasons. And um, we literally dumped these bags out on this church floor in this village. And we're like, does anybody have kids? Do you know a kid? Do you know somebody who might one day have a kid? Do you, you know, does your auntie, cousin, whoever have a kid? Like, come get what you need. I mean, mass chaos. I'm talking, they came, sure did. Bagging up clothes, trying on, stripping their babies, trying stuff on. I mean, they're just, I mean, it was like awesome. It was like swap meet heaven. Like, it was just, like, awesome. Everybody's getting all this clothes. And I'm telling our team, we are not going home with clothes. So you dump out those suitcases, zip it up, and walk away. <laughs> Don't let anything get back in there. We've got to leave tomorrow. Like, this is crazy. So we're just dumping stuff out, and people are coming and um, getting all this stuff. And 
we're, you know, the whole time I'm like, wow, God, you're so awesome. Like, you're so awesome. And, you know, I, I say this because the part that really, I mean, that was obviously hugely impactful, but the part that really impacted me was um, after the trip, we went home, and sometimes you do when you go on trips like this or if you go into places where there's lots of critters, we left our suitcases in the garage. Good tip. Those of you going to Uganda, if you're not staying somewhere where you're like, your suitcase also gets to be in a mosquito net, you might want to just, you know, leave it in the garage for a minute. Let the little creatures crawl out. <clears throat> and um, so we left our suitcase in the garage. Everything was filthy. And, and um, I went out to do laundry, and I, um, I opened it up. And I'm sitting there, and I'm pulling out our clothes <clears throat> to get it ready and um, to throw in the washer. And all of a sudden, I start to pull out of my suitcase. Now, our personal suitcases were never with the team suitcases, ever. They were in our possession the entire time. Out of my suitcases, I start to pull out this beautiful little baby girl clothes. And I sat on the floor and just wept and wept and wept and was just like, God, you are so wild. You are so wild. And I knew in that moment that if you make it your priority to seek first the kingdom, if you make it your priority to seek God's agenda, to take care of his business, I'm telling you, he will be so faithful to add to you everything you need. And let me say this. That was just the beginning. My children have never lacked for clothes. My children have never lacked for anything. They have been so extravagantly blessed by God. I'm telling you, he is faithful. He is so faithful. Amen? Okay, let's continue on. So Jesus is, is outlining this. He's talking about trusting him. He's a good father, all of that, right? And then it goes on, and it, um, Matthew 7, I'm going to be in the, tra the Passion Translation here. It says, refuse to be a critic, full of bias toward others. Okay. Do I need to read that one more time? Jesus said, refuse to be a critic, full of bias toward others, and judgment will not be passed on you. I call this the judgment trap. The enemy tries to lure you in to get you to be a critic, to get you to judge, and then he throws it back in your face, and you end up being the one getting judged. Don't fall into the trap. Jesus says, refuse to be a critic, and judgment will not be passed on you. Let me just say this. If you're going to refuse to be a critic, that means you're going to have to become an expert in seeing the golden people. You're going to have to be an expert on focusing on the good, not seeing all the bad. You're going to have to become an expert on, on truly seeing somebody at the end of the race, right? Who they are and, and what, um, what God has for them. And so he says, refuse to be a critic Judgment will not be passed on you. Verse 2, for you'll be judged by the same standard that you've used to judge others. The measurement you use on them will be used on you. Why would you focus on the flaw? Listen to this. Why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and yet fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own? I love this. Why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and yet fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own? How could you say to your friend, let me show you where you're wrong when you're guilty of even more? You're being hypocritical and a hypocrite. First acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them, and then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your friend. What if Christians just did this every once in a while? I mean, what if we actually just lived the Bible? Isn't this awesome? It's actually really freeing to not feel like you have to be the judge and jury for the whole world. It's really freeing, right? Right? You know, the enemy, one of his names is called the accuser. He loves to try to lure us into accusing, judging, critiquing. And Jesus is like, hey, guys, don't even bite the bait. It's not who you are. Don't bite the bait. You're not going to change the world by telling the world how wrong it is. The world gets transformed by love, by compassion, right? I love this. And so Jesus is challenging us to believe the best in people. Which, why don't you just do this? Repeat after me. Assumption is demonic. Say it again. Tell your spouse, just kidding. Um, <laughs> t 
don't, don't do that. I want you to stay married. Um, <laughs> assumption is demonic. And we think it's like normal. We think somehow we're just, oh, we'll put a, we'll put a religious bow on it. We're, oh, that's discernment, sister. No, that's still assumption. You're, it's easy, right? It's, it can be easy to make assumptions about people who are different than you, who vote differently than you. You assume you know their motive. Oh, I know their motive. Oh, do you? Because you're God. Oh, I'm just looking at the fruit. Well, through a very slanted lens of your own. Too honest? Assumption. I mean, the Bible has a lot to say about assumption. And another word that's used in scripture, which is assumption, is surmising. God has a lot to say about that. Assumption is not from God. Assumption, believing, because most of the times assumption is, you're belie- unless you're assuming the best in people, but believing the, you know, assuming you know their agenda, their motive, that's, that's not godly. That's not love. That's not believing the best. That's actually rooted in judgment. And Jesus says, don't have anything to do with that. Because that comes from The accuser. That is a fruit of the accuser's work. Don't participate in it, right? Now, it doesn't mean you're never going to help somebody see their own blind spots. But if we don't deal with our own bias and judgment and pride and lenses, we're not going to have authority to speak into other people's lives, right? We first work on us before we, we try to help lead other people. And I love this because where it says, the last sentence there, And then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your what? Not random Facebook person. (laughs) This happens over the dinner table. This happens in the context of friendship. This happens in the context of relationship. We cannot try to change people, influence people that you are not willing to invest in. You know why Jesus could influence people because he came and got on a cross for them. We're trying to influence people. We're not even willing to make our own friend, right? If you, you know, to really have impact and influence, you, it, that happens in the context of relationship, real relationship. Walk alongside an immigrant before you develop an opinion. Walk alongside somebody in homosexuality before you develop an opinion, Walk alongside somebody who's a single mom before you develop an opinion, right? Influence and and all that takes place in the context of relationship. Love, somebody feeling love, not just being told, right? We talked about this a few weeks ago. You can speak truth and it can still be coming from a wrong spirit and you still get cast out by the Apostle Paul. Remember that? You guys weren't here for that? Anybody? Okay. It's not about the truth coming out your mouth. It's about is there love in your heart connected to that truth, right? What spirit is it coming out of? So this is interesting. So Jesus is outlining this, right? He's talking about don't be a critic. Don't be, you know, hypocritical. Acknowledge your own blind spots. Deal with them. So this is interesting because first he's talking about, hey, guys, I'm your provider. I'm a good father. I know what you need, right? Seek first my kingdom. And then he goes into this. And he's talking about, like, I'm a good father. I'm a good father. Here's how to live. Here's how to love people. And it kind of, at first, you feel like, this is kind of a weird sermon point. So suddenly talking about judgment, right? And then it goes on. It gets even weirder. Verse 6, he says, Who would hang earrings on a dog's ear or throw pearls in front of wild pigs? They'll only trample them under their feet and then turn around and tear you to pieces. You're like, that's just got weird real quick, right? All of a sudden, we're talking about dogs, pigs, pearls. What is happening? What's happening? And, you know, I've heard a lot of people um, use this verse as a standalone. They'll quote this one verse and not in the context of the sermon Jesus is giving. And so this one verse as a standalone, and it could be used in a way that, that can feel almost offensive, like, you know, sometimes I've heard people use this saying like, oh, well, you know, that work environment, they don't, you know, I'm not going to cast my pearls in front of those dogs and swines. Like, they don't deserve me. And it's like, ooh, I don't think that's what that verse means, you know. Um, 
you have to take scripture. You can, anybody can take a random scripture and make it mean whatever you want. You've got to take scripture in context, right? You've got to look at the bigger picture. What is Jesus saying? And so I think this is very interesting that Jesus drops this in the middle of his sermon on not being judgmental. Because um, it almost sounds like he's judgmental, right? It's like, what, what, is, this, what is he saying here? But I want, I want us to look at this because the first thing is, in this, you know, time in history, this isn't like, you know, L.A. dogs. Okay, I know. I know what you guys do. I've seen your dogs. They've got Converse painted nails. They drink lattes. You have strollers for your dogs. Okay, I'm, this isn't, this is not what he's referring to. Um, in this time and culture, you know, this is, a dog and, and a pig is, is really insulting, right? It's, this is considered, like, these are wild animals. These are, you know, this is not like your family pet. This is, dogs were like kind of ran in packs and were just kind of scavengers and wild. So you have this, Jesus saying this, and it's so strange. And he's saying, don't throw the gold, you know, the gold, many um, verses say the gold um, earrings or the, the pearls. Now, throughout scripture, you see many times Jesus relating um, the pearl to the kingdom, right? The pearl, many times you talk about the pearl being the kingdom, finding the great pearl, the kingdom of God, the gold, the sacred. So it's pretty easy to, to understand that this means don't throw what is sacred, the kingdom, in front of pigs and dogs or those who act like pigs and dogs. So what is Jesus saying? Because that sounds like he's been real judgy. Um. I do think this is interesting, and I'll say this. If you take this in context, he's talking about don't be judgmental, right? This is the sermon on don't be judgmental. Who was Jesus' greatest beef with all the time? Many people have interpreted this to mean don't put the kingdom in front of unbelievers. They just, you know, sinners, Look, it's too sacred, it's too holy. That's always dumbfounded me because everything that Jesus did in his life was put the kingdom in front of sinners and the unholy, right? Jesus never withheld the kingdom from anybody. In fact, those that the people of his day referred to as dogs and pigs, he's like, they're my new number one. Oh, you see them like that? Come, you inherit the kingdom. Come, go and send them. He, he embraces people. He, he's so loving and good. So certainly he can't be talking about sinners. And it's interesting because, I don't know if you've noticed in Scripture, who did Jesus save his strongest words for? Right? The Pharisees. Let me give you an example if you're like, really? Um, just in Matthew 23, verses 13 through 16, just in a few, like what, four, can't do math, four little, four little verses. Let me tell you the words he calls Pharisees in these four verses. Ready? Brace yourself. Brace yourself like a man. <laughs> he calls the Pharisees frauds, pretenders, children of hell, blind guides, deceivers, nitpickers, imposters, foolish, greedy, self-indulgent, blind and deaf, tombs painted with fresh coats of paint, masqueraders, decaying corpses, hypocrites, corrupt, lawless, murderers, snakes, offspring of poisonous vipers, let's be specific, <laughs> abusers, and persecutors. Oh, Jesus be mad, right? Jesus is mad. What is happening? You don't ever see Jesus talk about sinners or the lost like that. But he has some strong things to say about the judgmental. Because the Pharisees were the king of judgment. Were they not? He had some strong words to say about people who in the name of God, in the name of God, opposed the kingdom. In the name of God, oppose the kingdom. The kingdom, which is about love, which is about peace, which is about healing, which is about unity, which is about inclusion, right? The people who, in the name of God, try to maintain their power and ex exclude, try to, to critique and judge and push people away. He had some strong words to say to those people. I personally, take it or leave it, you can work this out with the Holy Spirit, I personally believe that this verse, of all the places in the Bible he could have dropped it, dropping this little 
gem right here of interestingness, dropping this in the middle of a sermon on judgment, to me, speaks to dogs and pigs referencing a spirit, that the religious spirit. Trying to link kingdom, trying to associate with, trying to, to partner with, trying to work together with a religious spirit in the kingdom, it doesn't work. This concept of there comes a time when he's like, hey, don't be judgmental, but there also comes a time when you need to put healthy boundaries and not associate with a judgmental spirit and not keep trying to, to work with and partner with something that is so anti-kingdom. Take it or leave it. Okay. So we go on. Verse 7. And then from this, he, he continues his teaching. Ask, and the gift is yours. Seek, and you'll discover. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For every persistent one will get what he asked for. Every persistent seeker will discover what he longs for. And everyone who knocks persistently will one day find an open door. I love this. I love that Jesus is bouncing back and forth, right? He's like, I'm a good father. I'm looking after your needs. Hey, don't be a jerk. Hey, I'm a good father, right? Like, he's just kind of going back and forth here. And I think there's a, there's a reason to that, but and I'll explain that in a second. But he's back at this, I got you, right? Now, we, he just told us earlier, I will provide everything you need. I know what your needs are. Seek my kingdom and I'll add to you. But now he's saying, but I actually want you to participate, I actually want you to ask. Don't just sit around and wait for me to add to you. I actually want you to ask. I want you to seek. I want you to knock. Why? Why? I don't know about you, but I wrestle these kinds of questions out. I am like such a question person. I'm like, you just told me you'd add it to me. Why do I have to ask, right? You're a good father. Why do I have to ask you? I wrestle this out. And let me tell you why. If we were just going about our lives... And all these blessings are just happening in our life. And that was just what God did. He just, you know, things were just happening. You didn't have to have any involvement in it. What would you do? You'd be like, I'm pretty awesome. I mean, it's my charisma, clearly. It's my skill set. This is always my classic favorite. I love when people like to, to uh, <laughs> oh, help me, Jesus. <sighs> when they say it's their work ethic. They're blessed because their work ethic. As if somebody who's poor who works 10 times harder than them. Okay, I can't. Um, <laughs> we start to think that we're the reason. We start to think it's about us. We've lost our dependency on God. We don't understand that every good thing comes from him, right? And he's more than just making sure you have your daily bread, which trust me, he wants to make sure you have. He wants to make sure your heart is good for eternity, he wants to make sure faith and relationship are con and connection are alive in you. He doesn't just want a, us to sit back and we're not just on this ride like God's just doing whatever he wants and we're all just sitting here. No, you are a co-creator with God. You are an active participant in what's going to go down on this planet, right? This is, God has made you a powerful person. You get to shift things by your prayers, by your asking, by your believing, by your connecting with him. It's, it's incredible when you begin to understand that. I'm not just, you know, everything's, you know, going to just happen how it happens, and it's all just predetermined, and I just get to sit here. No. Mm -mm. I'm sorry. You picked and choose on your verses. Because the Bible is all about faith without works. The Bible is all about, right, ask and you shall receive. The Bible is all about our partnership with Christ in this. You're a huge piece to play in this. And so, yes, as you seek his kingdom, he's going to provide for you. At the same time, he wants to hear your heart. And some of us, I think, maybe we don't even ask. And he's saying, hey, I actually want you to ask. And maybe you're like, I asked and I got to no. know. Well, let me tell you this. If my kids said, hey, mom, can I drink this red Kool-Aid on the white carpet? No, you cannot. And they asked me five more times, nope, you cannot. They might change the question. Hey, mom, can I drink this red Kool-Aid at the table? Uh, yeah, after you eat these 47 vegetables. You know, whatever. 
You don't start asking better questions by not asking. You ask better questions by continuing to ask. You, you mature in your asking by asking, not by sitting. So there's nothing wrong with asking. Continue to ask. Continue to press in and say, you know, God, am I asking the right questions? I'm asking for this. I'm believing for this, right? Ask him. He wants you to ask. He says, in fact, ask, and the gift is yours. I love this. For some of us, I want to encourage you, if you've maybe kind of gotten a little quiet and you're asking, or you're like, that just feels whatever, I want to encourage you that we're in a season right now. I mean, this is, it's always time to pray, but we're in a season where I just feel this urgency. Actually, this whole message today was out of this, what was really stormy was this passage, ask, seek, knock, ask, seek, knock, ask, seek, knock. I just can hear it in my spirit. And I feel like God is saying, what do you want to ask me for? Right? How many of us know the scripture, we have not because we ask not? I wonder how much we have not because we've not asked. Are you actually asking for the things you're dreaming of? Ask, ask, right? And I want to say this, God isn't this vending machine. He's not this like, you know, genie in a bottle. But when you're seeking first his kingdom, when his kingdom really is your priority, your asking is going to become more mature. Your asking will get healthier. Sometimes, you know, Later on in this passage, it, it talks about when, when a son asks for um, a fish, right? His father's not going to give him a snake. Or when the son asks for bread, his father's not going to give him a stone. Some of you maybe have been getting a no because you've actually been asking for a snake. And your good father, in his love, has said no. Maybe it's time to start asking for the fish, right? So changing the question, but pressing in and the asking and the second part of that is seek and you will find or seek and you'll discover. Now, seeking is different than asking. Asking is, is prayer. It's petition. Seeking is more action. It's like the difference of saying, I need a job. God, please help me to get a job. And then continuing to sit on the couch and do nothing. But many of us do that in our prayer life. I prayed about it. So seeking is the, next, is the next phase. I'm going to go out and look to see how those things might be answered. I'm going to go out and see how I could possibly be the answer to my own prayer. I'm going to seek. I'm going to search. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find testimonies. I'm going to study. I'm going to, um, whatever it is, I'm going to seek it out. I'm going to press in. I'm going to get into scripture. I'm going to get something to hold on to. I, whatever it is, I'm going to seek. A lot of that is we end at asking Let's say, for example, God, I feel like you've called me um, to do something for your kingdom with photography. So we pray about photography, we, we pray that, and then we stop. Go study good photographers. Go, go do free photography. Go get in it. Go just get all up in it. Go seek it out, right? That's part of it. And you're like, well, that feels like striving. No, that sounds like wisdom. <laughs> right? So seek, seeking, you, you take action, you, you start digging in, you start wrestling it out. You start saying, okay, God, how, how is this working? What could that look like, right? We used to send our interns to different organizations that we loved in the city. We're like, go just serve them for a day and ask them all these questions. Go, go, go pick their brains. Go, you know, I, I think Bill Johnson said one time, if you, if you don't have a roadmap for your life yet, get in the car with somebody who does. And just watch how they read their roadmap, and then you'll get your own map, right? Seek it out. I love that. And then the final thing, which I love this, is Jesus says, and then knock. You'll notice it's progressive here. It's, it's ask, it's seek, and now it's knock, and the door will be opened to you. And this is the one I cannot shake in my spirit. I keep hearing the Lord say, expression 58, it is time to knock. Start knocking on doors. And here's what you need to know about knocking. You knock on something that's closed. As if we're going to knock on an open door. You have no need to knock on a door that's cracked open even. You knock on something that is closed and locked and solid. You've already had the no. The door is shut. It's an impossibility. It's just not going to happen. Everybody's told you it can't happen. It's a big, fat, flipping, closed door. And that's when you start knocking. I love this. 
Knock and the door will be open for every persistent one. Say persistent. persistent. We need to learn the character and the art of persistence. The persistent one will get what he asks for. Every persistent seeker will discover what he longs for. And everyone who knocks persistently will one day find an open door. We used to joke with Sheree years ago that, that we were going to do a sermon called um, Wait That Mother Out. <laughs> that was going to be the sermon title. About how if you just wait it out, the one who just is still knocking when everybody else gave up is the one who gets to go in. How true is that in life? Just wait that mother out. I mean, it's a terrible title, but <laughs> it's all we could think of. Um, you just got to wait it out. Persistence. Continue to show up. Continue to believe, right? And let me tell you, if we, I, I find this to be true with people who are like, oh, you know, I know God, especially in supernatural kind of charismatic Pentecostal environments, well, I know God can do anything, so that means I don't have to do anything because God's going to do everything. I don't have to do anything. No. That's not how it works, right? There's something to be said about if you don't have the tenacity and the focus and the commitment to, to knock when your hand's starting to hurt and to knock and keep facing the nose and keep believing God when God's calling you through that door, if you don't have the persistency, you're not fit to walk through what's behind that door. Once again, he's developing your greater who you are, right? It's, it's more about your heart and your character and what he's, he wants you to be sustained in that place when you get there, not be taken out because it got hard once you finally got through the big fat door. He's, there's, his wisdom is not ours, right? So I love this, and I so hear the Spirit saying, it's time to start knocking. I keep having this vision, and I see this thing switch where you guys know that like picture. It's like the classic. Maybe your grandma or somebody gave it to you on graduation day or something. It's like Jesus knocking at the heart, the door of your heart. You guys seen that picture? The little cards in your Bible. Okay. Um, so I see that picture, and all of a sudden I see it switch, and I, I hear the Lord saying, "Yes, I stand at the door of hearts and knock, but I'm also standing at my door in, the, in heaven and looking to see who's knocking on my door." And I see him standing on the other side of the door. That's the picture I keep having. I've had it for months. And I hear him saying, who wants it? Like, who wants it bad enough they're willing to come up here and knock on my door? Who's willing to come knock on the door of heaven? Who's willing to come and knock on the door of heaven? And I'm telling you guys, I'm telling you he's a good father. He is a good father. And if you will be persistent and you will, you will trust him and you will say, I know who my God is and I am seeking his kingdom and I know what I'm called to do and I am not going to take, I'm not going to stop. We're going to see this thing shift. We're going to see this injustice shift. I am not going to stop knocking until it does. We're going to see this thing, you know, take, take shape or whatever. I, I, I'm going to press in until I see God move. And I love what he goes on to say because it's the, the story I was already telling you, but Jesus tells a story. He says, verse 9. Do you know of any parent who would give his hungry child who asked for food a plate of rocks instead? Or when he asked for a piece of fish, what parent would offer his child a snake instead? If you, imperfect as you are, know how to lovingly take care of your children and give them what's best for them, how much more ready is your heavenly Father to give wonderful gifts to those who ask him? Listen to me, your Father is so good. He knows what you need. But I also want to encourage you to begin to ask, to begin to seek, to begin to knock for real. Like, some of you, you just need to go home and write that proposal you have been sitting on for way too long. You need to make that phone call. You need to, to apply for that thing. You need you, Take that step of knocking. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, our God is the God who opens up doors that no man can shut. Becky gave us a word this morning. We're stepping into the miraculous. I'm telling you, if you have ears to hear, if you have ears to hear, this is the season to begin to knock on those closed doors. Our God is the God who opens them. Amen. Amen. I'm going to end with this. The very end of this passage, verse 12, Jesus goes back to this, right? So first he's talked about 
I provide for you, I'm a good father, then he goes into don't be judgmental, then he goes back into I'm gonna provide for you, and then he comes back into this last, he bounces back into how to treat people, and he says, verse 12, in everything you do, be careful to treat others in the same way you'd want them to treat you, for that is the essence of all the teachings of the law and the prophets. And I love this, because he goes back and forth, he bounces back between understanding how good our father is and how that actually reflects in how you treat people. You see, when you know your God is good, you have no need to try to judge people, fix people, do what you understand his goodness for you and for them, right? When you know your God is faithful and you don't have to hustle for your worthiness, you don't have to hustle for, you don't have to perform for him, you can turn and treat people with that same grace and kindness and love and respect. It's hard to honor people when you're in so much anxiety and strife within yourself, right? So I love this. I love that Jesus is going back and forth. That as we have a greater revelation of who our father is, as our provider and as our good daddy, it will reflect out in how we treat people and how we love people. Amen? Will you stand with me as we close? I want to pray over us. I want to pray this morning. I want to pray for courage. How many of you as you're sitting here, you're like, man, that is me. I, I have been asking, I am seeking, but I know I need to start knocking on some doors. Okay, there's a few of you. In, okay, good. How many of you are like, I kind of just gave up on the asking for whatever reason, and I need to start, I need to start that whole thing again. I need to start talking to God. Yeah, you don't have to raise your hand. You're like, hey. um, Listen, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. We are a family, and I want to encourage you guys. Listen, I want to encourage you. We are not content with a few people just getting a breakthrough. We're going to celebrate that. That is awesome. We want everyone in this community to break through together. We want everyone in this community to fully be who God has called you to be. We want every one of you to experience all that God has for you in this season. We want to see every one of you fully walk into God's highest and best in your life. Amen? So let's pray. Jesus, I thank you, God, that you are such a good father. I pray that you would realign our focus, Lord, to truly pursue your kingdom and your righteousness, God. Anywhere where we've gotten a little off, God, and maybe pursuing a little bit of our own kingdom or a little bit of our own righteousness, God, I pray that you would realign us with full pursuit, full pursuit of your kingdom and your righteousness. And I thank you, God, that you will be so faithful to add everything we need. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be professional, I don't know the only word I can think of is gold diggers, um, professional <laughs> gold diggers of humanity. <laughs> Some of you trying to claim that in the wrong way. Lord, I pray freedom for those people. Just kidding. Um, Lord, I pray that we would be professional gold diggers, Lord, in seeing the gold in people and digging it out, God. I pray, God, that we would not be caught up in what people are doing wrong or how they're living wrong or how they're voting wrong or how they're existing wrong. Lord, I pray that you would free us from judgment, free us from critique. Lord, I pray that you would pull your church out of the judgment trap, God, and that we would get so honed in to how you see people, God, that we would be ones who love wildly, God. And I pray, Lord, that we would get free Lord, from um, examining what's in everybody else's eye, God, that we would look in our own, Lord. I pray that you would free us, Lord. And I pray for the courage to walk in real relationship with people, God. I thank you, God, that our influence only goes as far as our love. And so, God, I pray that you'd expand our love for people. Expand our love for people, God. And Jesus, I ask, Lord, even as, as the last couple of weeks you've been speaking this over and over and over in my spirit, I know this is a word for us as a family. It is time for us to ask, to seek, to knock, because it's time to discover. It's time to have open doors. It's time for us to, to inherit the kingdom. And so, God, I pray for everyone in this room. I pray for the courage, the courage to begin to, to, to ask, to seek, and to knock, Lord. Anywhere where we kind of grew weary in that process, Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to begin to ask better questions. To begin to ask a little differently, God. To begin to uh, improve the ask, Lord. As our focus on you gets sharper. 
And Lord, I thank you, and I can sense in my spirit, God, I thank you that doors are opening in this season. And we just decree it and we declare it. The doors that have been closed and straight locked up for a long time are going to open in the name of Jesus, Lord, as your kingdom advances. We just declare, God, that, that you open doors that no man can shut. So we align ourselves to that truth, God. We want to see your kingdom move forward, your agenda move forward. I pray for your faith, just faith to fill us and courage in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you guys.